Welcome back to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld. And if you've been watching this program, you know it's about the orientation of consciousness, evolution of spirit that we're in. And I'm really happy to have with me today an old friend, a good friend, someone, someone who I actually knew was going to make it. I mean, I, I heard Paul Selig channel one night in his apartment. I said, that's 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 the real stuff. That really, Paul, I I I I'm like a talent scout for the new age. <laughs> yeah. And and his latest book, I'll show you his latest book, which is really worth reading, I would say. I mean, they're all worth reading, but this one, Resurrection, it, it when when I was reading it, it had the same feeling as I am the word, like the the pages start to give me. A, a, a vibration yeah. and 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 um I, this i also said to you what, what i thought was um when you first wrote i thought you were going to do like a series three three books in a series i thought you're going to have three series of books but this is your 10th book so yeah. this i mean it seems like the guides work that way so this is it's like you're on to a whole other series so do you want, I want to talk to you about so many things like your relationship with the guys, but also some of the terms I was not familiar with. Like, can you explain what do they mean by the upper room? I know they've been talking about that for a while, but they mm -hmm. talk about a lot in this book. Can you explain that? I'll, I'll try. You know, I mean, I always have to say I can interpret their teachings, but mostly I'm just the radio for it. So the guides have said that we're experiencing reality in an octave and an octave is made of high and low tones or notes. And they say that any piece of music can be played in a higher octave. And they say that the upper room is the octave above the one that we know ourselves of. Sometimes they call it the common field. Um, so what they're doing in their work seems to be to transpose our vibration, our level of consciousness to align to the higher so that we're not replicating the old, because all we know in this sort of reality is what we've been taught. And we're operating from a, a sense of memory that's been entrenched in a belief that we're separate from each other in source and, you know, uh, a world that in some ways is, 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 has been claimed in fear. And they say in the upper room, fear really doesn't express. It's just, it just doesn't go there because it's a lower tone. It's a lower octave. But they say pretty drastic things in this book, like uh, the structure that you have utilized to determine what reality should be is actually in collapse. Yeah. Uh, because, but, but how do they, well, I guess there's signs all around, but what do they say it's in collapse? What do they mean? They said in the very first book, which was channeled in 2009, that humanity was at a time of reckoning. And they said a reckoning is a facing of the self and all of one's creations. And that everything that's been sort of created or agreed to, which and agreed to for them, I think would mean incoherence with fear is going to have to be renowned in a higher way. So institutions and systems that are sort of informed by fear or have been claimed in fear are going to have to be renown. Now, I don't get that the collapse is, you know, apocalyptic necessarily. People want to go there. But one of the metaphors they use, and they do use some pretty wild metaphors. They talk about like, you know, huge waves of energy or riding a wave of change and the things that can't be held in the higher are moved or washed away. But one of them that I like, they talk about, you know, when you plant a new seed, the earth is is dislodged. It's moved as the seed appears. And in some ways, that's the falling away of the old. So I understand right now that we can't really. I don't think we're off the hook. I don't think we get to bypass what our creations are. And that includes how awful we treat one another and war and all of the things that we've done in in, in perpetuating greed or systems of control over others. I think all of those things are having to be seen so that we can choose something other. 
And that's some of what they're doing. They're bringing us to a place where when our choices aren't informed by the old, so we're not mandating that what was be perpetuated because what was clearly isn't working for us terribly well. You know, not to get too personal, but I see your life and what you've been through and where you are now as being transformed. You are living in the upper room. Would you agree with that? That you're happier maybe? Yeah, I am happier. I'm more at peace. I'm living a much better life and a healthier life. And I feel enormously grateful, but that and I'm not saying I abide in the upper room and or that I've ascended. I'm, I'm not that grandiose. I still have my challenges. I still want to get a date. I want all the things, you know, I'm still complaining all the time, the things that I know myself through. But I do have to say that the process has been extraordinary with this stuff. And I am living a life now that I could not have imagined or would have known to choose because it wasn't on the menu of choices that I grew up with. And the guides say, you know, we're always choosing off of an inherited menu of what we're allowed or who we think we can be. So, you know, I can't say that it's perfect, but yeah, and it is the outcome of a lot of process and also moving through a lot of crap. And I had a lot of crap to move through and I probably still do. I'm not off the hook. But I, I'm aware of this and I'm aware that my life in some ways is more evidential to the teachings. And I'm surprised by that and grateful because I wasn't looking for this. This is sort of was the byproduct of something else. You know, I wasn't looking to get a career as a channel. I just wanted to do my work. You know, that was it. And I still just want to do my work. And as long as they keep wanting to talk, I'm going to show up because that's my part of the agreement. But the affect on my life and my consciousness, I think, has been significant, to say the least. I don't always see it because, you know, I still see myself in the mirror and go, you know, what the hell is it? But I, I understand that that's what has occurred. Well, it does seem evidential that the teachings are working mm -hmm. for you. And I would say for everyone who reads these books, because there's a vibrate, you feel it off the pages. I'm not, I was going to ask you, how do you do it? But you don't know how you do it. <laughs> they just... Yeah, the guides, they said it from the, the, the very first book, that, which was called I Am the Word. They said, this is a, you know, this is a book that's experienced more than read. It's not a self-help book. They don't work that way. But they're basically saying that the language that they work with is encoded with vibration. And that the real book is the transmission of the vibration. And that the reader is being worked with as they're working with the text. So there's an odd collaboration. And that's continued um, with all of the books. They're all comparable. I think Resurrection is, is, is kind of potent. It's kind of like a, you know, they're, they're not mincing words at all anymore. They're just sort of saying this is what it is and this is how it's done. You know, it's very potent. But what's interesting, if you go for the last nine books to this book the 10th there's a curriculum that seems to be late like they knew and i think even this is hinting of another maybe 10 books like they laid in the first book they laid out steps and you think oh okay that's the first yeah. book and that's great and then they're picking up concepts and developing them as if there's like does that surprise you that they had some, because you used to say i don't know what's coming through but <laughs> It, you know, every time they would finish a book, I thought, well, that's it. There's nothing else for them to say. And then what they will do is they'll unpack an idea or a phrase from a previous book, and it's an entire teaching. And I'm always surprised by that. But when, you know, the very first book, which I haven't revisited in a long time, in some ways, I think may hold the DNA for everything that follows. They're talking about how a world is made new, I think, in the first book and how systems are altered and changed. And the first book was really just about the awakening of the, the true self or the Christ itself or the monad, whatever they want to call it, because they call it, you know, that that language has, has also moved as they've continued to teach. 
So I think what they're doing is they're fulfilling the promise of the first text through all of these books. And I look at the first text as enormously important, but it's also a doorway that you can go through. And then there are other doorways and each one is sort of leaving you in a new threshold, in a new place, um, in an encounter with yourself and I guess them as well. You know, and then the re retreats are also another level, the in-person yeah. activation. But what I want to say is that, you know, it's it's so deep. And I, I was just thinking, talking to you, you, you not and you're very humble, but you not to take it too egotistically, but you are one of the great channels of our day. There's been some great, there's Edgar Casey, there's Jane Roberts and Seth. And it's not you, it's the material. The material is applicable for everyday life. A lot of channels, I'm like a channeling snob. They just talk about, you know, what could be, would be. But what's so important about the guides is this is the work. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's why people love you, Paul. Well, thank you for saying that. And I'm, you know, I, I used to say, you know, I'm a radio. That's my job. And the radio doesn't always get to dance to the music. And I remember a third of what comes through me after I channel. I'm not a trans channel. But I, um, I know that the guides are teachers and they have their own agenda. So, you know, I think it would be fun to tell everybody how to make a lot more money or how to you know, what's happening on this planet over there. I just, it's just not what comes through me. Other right people now, are ready. Yeah. And I'm grateful just for what comes through. Oh, well, um, I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm curious though, a little off the subject of the book, but how has your relationship with the guides changed or deepened? I mean, you have this relationship. You would always yeah. have a relationship, Paul. Here it is. <laughs> No, I don't, you know, I think it's an interesting thing to talk about because I just finished channeling the, uh, the 11th book mm -hmm. and that came very fast. And some of it was done while I had COVID. It was just a nutty period. And, um, and I don't remember the book yet. You know, I won't probably really revisit it until I have to proof the manuscript, you know, when it's in galleys or do the audio book. When I it's changed over the years because when I first started hearing, I was hearing fragments and phrases. I had a group that met in my apartment about for 18 years, and I wasn't expecting to channel there. I was expecting to do the energy work that I had learned from a teacher. And then the very first group, I started getting instructions that made no sense. And the group was wonderfully encouraging because I'd say, I think I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing. And they just say, stop saying, I think I'm hearing and just say what you're hearing. And I did this work less so to channel. I don't even know how much I really believed in channeling. I wasn't a tremendous fan or proponent of it. Um, I'd read half a Seth book when I was in grad school and I thought it was fascinating and amazing and I knew it was real somehow. It totally spoke to me, but I, I wasn't gobbling up stuff. And the guides were bringing through energy in those initial groups and the energy was palpable. We could all feel it. And I was there to be in the energy and to share the experience with other people, which validated whatever they were bringing through. If the guides would say, everybody, we're going to put a hand on everybody's forehead and the whole room goes like that. I mean, it was like Beetlejuice. It was like, whoa, we were all getting this together. And it was very exciting. And I, you know, I was a college teacher for 25 years. I wasn't looking to get known for, for this stuff. And you had to know somebody to come to my group. I didn't have a, we didn't even have websites when I started. I quit smoking when I was 48, when I was a four pack a day smoker and I was a really good smoker. I loved it. You know, it was killing me. And the guide said in a group one day, we want to continue working with you, but you're going to have to stop this in order for us to continue. And I actually stopped the next day, as I recall, and I was quite surprised that I was able to. And I got some help, but I did it. And that's when they started lecturing. And all I knew was that I was talking more and I wasn't interested. I was never that interested in what they had to say, truthfully. 
I was interested in the energy because you can't fake the energy. I'm going, well, who am I to say all this stuff that I'm hearing? Who the hell knows? And the lectures continued and the energy was as potent, if not more as, as anything. And when they said, we have a book to write and if you take two weeks, we'll do it. That came when I had just been canned from a writing job. I, you know, I was, I, my ego was quashed. I mean, I, I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care what people thought for that moment in time. And I, I thought, okay, well, I suddenly have free time. Why not? And the book took two and a half weeks to, to dictate. And it didn't require any editing. It took longer to type than it took to dictate. I didn't even realize that the book made sense until the whole thing was together. So I trust them now to show up. They show up whenever I show up. And when I would question this phenomena, which I, I would do, and I'm still uncomfortable with it sometimes, I have to say, I don't care how eloquent I might be. I'm not capable of closing my eyes and speaking 11 books into, into form that don't require editing. There's like three words in a book that might get changed because I mispronounced them or I was speaking so fast you, you couldn't make it out in the recording. So it's better, but they, I, I still wonder sometimes, even after being given a life that feels at least at this moment somewhat graced, you know, I don't know if they, you know, I, when my, when I have my personal wants and my agendas, I don't know how that, I don't know that that's important to them, really. I think they're here to teach and um, everything else is what comes. Well, everything else is an application of the principles, your life, changing your life. Yeah, it is. And it has. And I, I feel that. But sometimes people assume that because I can do this, you know, I can go anywhere get any information and i'm very good with other people i have a practice as a psychic and how i work as a psychic is different than how i work as a channel you know i'm a radio for the guides but if i'm reading you you're the radio station that i tune into and then i can hear you and if you want to know about a relationship or a family member i can tune into them and i may start to resemble them and hear them it's generally clear audience and clear sentience with me and at that level, I can be effective, but those of us, the readers that I know, the psychics and channels that I know, few of us are really reading for ourselves because we have investments. We still have egos and we want to know the outcome the way we want to hear it. If I want a neutral, if I want a neutral opinion, I'm going to go to somebody else. What I'm interested is in this inner, like these lights, they're in your head or wherever they are, you're picking them mm -hmm. and, and that they're, they're a being, I would say they're probably separate from you in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that relationship and that clarity mm -hmm. input is a change that deepens. You get a sense of who these beings are a little more. I mean, what's developed? There, there's one that I've seen and I've only seen him. I think I've seen him three or four times now. And the first time somebody hypnotized me, and I didn't know where we were going with the hypnosis. And then he said, and now your guide is going to come sit next to you. I'm like, oh, brother, that's not going to happen. And sure enough. And I, I don't recall which book was being dictated, had just been dictated, but I had just channeled a workshop at the Kripalo Center. And for the first time, they had me get out of the chair and stand in front of each person. And my hands were up like this. And I'm going, what the f am I doing with my, my hands? I felt ridiculous. And I felt ridiculous standing in front of everybody. But I was sitting on a bench with this guide in this session. And he had a very big hat with a bit of a flat thing at the very top of it. It's almost like the Greek, or Greek or the Orthodox priests would wear, but it wasn't that. And a long white beard and pale, pale, profoundly compassionate eyes, um, pale blue eyes. And he was holding um, a scepter of some kind. It was a gold thing, like a staff, it was like yay big. And it was embossed, it wasn't engraved, it had hieroglyphics all over it. 
And I'm thinking, what is this? Because it was I was seeing it like that, which has happened before when I'm supposed to see something, they're going to bring it forward and, you know, again and again. And I heard this is what we use to attune people. And then I realized that's what I've been holding when I've been working. And the last time I saw him, I was at, I was channeling at the Esalen Institute um, at a symposium with some eggheads, you know, and there was a woman there who was doing a, a book on clear audience and I'm being interviewed by her. So, well, how do you know it's not you? How do you know it's not just you? And I'm going, I guess I don't. I don't know how it works. But I was shaken by the whole thing. And then to be nice, I went to somebody's guided meditation who was also in the group. Some woman was leading a guy. So I, I dragged my ass to this yurt, laid down in this yurt. And this woman's doing this long, long, long guided visualization, which I didn't like. <laughs> And at the bottom, she says, you get to the bottom of a ravine, you go down this long, long hill, she says, you're down at the bottom of the ravine, and then your guide is there. And I'm going, yeah, this is going to happen. And I look up and I see the same guide with the beard and the hat stumbling down this hill to the ravine. And he's carrying two scrolls, look at the Torah. And he said to me, stop trying to explain to people who you are, you don't know. And he left. And it was like the best thing ever. And I thought, great, that's good with me. So I know that they care and I feel loved and I feel supported, but I'm not having tea with them in the afternoons. Other people may do that, I don't. Kind of reminds me, though, that guy reminds me of you on some higher level. I mean, is that it could well be, you know, when I channel now and this is this started back then when I would go around in the circle. Um, my eyes turn pale blue. I mean, it's been seen. People have seen it for years. I've I seen think. it actually when we did yeah. some retreats. It's like, wow, there was something else coming through those eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go very pale blue when I have hazel eyes. And I always like that. And that happens when he steps in fully or they step in fully, you know, that they say, you know, basically it's kind of emerging that happens at that time. And it's more than I'm just taking dictation. They're really using my whole, my body and my energetic field to support a transmission that's very personal to those who are coming. But I mean, is this an aspect of me that's developed? I don't know. You know, I don't think so, but I understand there's a difference at times when I'm accessing a part of myself that's a little bit wiser. And I can sort of feel the difference when I sit down to channel, I do this little prayer protection that I use to, to recede. And it's always been the same. I hear one phrase repeated incessantly. Like, we are here to say, we are here to say, we are here to say. And I go, we are here to say, when I speak it, the whole lecture tumbles out on top of it. And it's they've prepared it. I'm just there trying to keep up. And at the end of the lecture, they'll say, stop now, please. And that's how I know they're done speaking. And my job is to fill that space between the first phrase and stop now, please, and just continue. It's like reading fortune cookies, one after the other, after the other, after the other. That's been the same process since 2009 when the first. Absolutely book. right. And it's Absolutely. the same today. You, you just do the same. It's. It's the same. I mean, there are times I think I'm much better now. I think I'm cleaner. I think I've been worked with to develop over these years. I think that my field isn't as dense. I'm not as frightened and as frustrated and confused by it all. I accept this now as a part of my life. It's a phenomena that's real to me, but do I walk around thinking about it all day? No, I don't. Why, why would I? I'm grateful that it occurs. Right, I, there's a couple of concepts in the book like interdimensionality. I don't know if you wanna bring through the guys or about just about what they mean because everyone uses that word interdimensionality and no one really knows. I don't know what they said about it, truthfully. Oh. I, don't recall, I don't recall it at all. Because they rarely speak, they use the word dimensions maybe three times in my life. Oh, it does not interdimension. It says a field is always present in these teachings when we wish you to understand the idea of dimensional realities, but reality. But there's levels of 
dimensional realities, but what do they mean by dimension, a dimensional reality? Let me see if I can get anything. And, you know, for, for people who haven't seen me do this, I whisper and repeat. I don't know. We would like to say one thing. We would like to say one thing, your assumption, your assumption that the world is that the world you see is the only world that is, is the only world that is because it's practical for your experience, because it's practical for your experience when we speak of other realities. When we speak of other realities, we speak of different tonalities, we speak of different tonalities things that exist things that exist concurrently, concurrently with what you see and feel, with what you see and feel. Each reality, each reality has its own concept, has its own concept, way of being witnessed, way of being witnessed experientially, experientially. What you know of as matter, what you know of as matter expresses in different ways, expresses in different ways, in different octaves, in different octaves. While matter may maintain itself, while matter may maintain itself, it is far more pliable in the higher octaves. It is far more pliable in the higher octaves because it is not claimed, because it is not claimed in a finite reality, in a finite reality, which is how you perceive yourselves, which is how you perceive yourselves, period. And they're saying period. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That that does explain it, that it goes back to what you were saying before. We can't perceive something that's not on our level. And the way to do this yeah. is to change the frequency somehow. But how do we like you've changed your frequency, but it happened. How do we will ourselves to, to- You don't will yourself. You can't will yourself. It's not done at that level. If, if that were the case, we'd all be doing it. Well, and I think, do you do? How do we, that's what the guides are teaching. Right, it's right. done at the level of what they call the true self or the monad. It's done at that level. So they say, you know, the small self is the personality structure, right? And there's nothing wrong with it. We, we need them. We have them. We've agreed to them. But what I understand is we think we're the personality structure. That's who we've mistaken ourselves to be. The personality structure, if I understand them, is reared in an agreement to history personal history and collective history, what we think the world is because we've been told it. You know what a chair is because somebody said that's a chair and that's what a chair does. And so we're confirming an existing idea of matter, what is and how things should be in accordance with that. So the guides say the small self thinks and the true self or the divine self knows and knowing is actually realization. So the God within that already knows is the aspect of self that is in rearticulation, or in this book, they call it resurrection, is resurrected as and through you. A lot of what's required for this is permission, period, because we, the guides don't override free will. We have free will. And if I mean that and still, I often say, you know, if I want to walk into traffic, they're not going to stop me. If I say, is this a good time to cross the street? They might say not wise, which means you want to walk into traffic, you can do it, but we can't stop you, but understand the ramifications of the choice you're making. So when you agree to this, and that was all of the books are really about this. Um, but the book where they really claim it big time, I think it's the it might be realization the first book where they introduce the upper room um and they say you go to the upper room and the claim that is made there is i have come i have come i have come which is the divine self or the monad announcing itself in its presence and they say when you make that claim in a lot of ways what you're doing is you're giving permission to that aspect of you to reclaim the aspects of self that have been reared in darkness or in alignment to false ideas of what truth is. So it's an alchemical process. You can't bang it into being, but you can align to it and give it permission to assume you. So the monad is what? That divine self? Is that what they mean by a monad? I think the very first book they talked about the Christ, they used the word Christ, and their definition of Christ was the aspect of the creator that can be realized in material form. It's the divine spark. Maybe, I don't know what else, maybe Shekinah, I don't know, there's words for it in every, in every language. Um, and then they've also called it the true self or the eternal self. Um, and the monad is where they've rested in the last several books, although they'll still use the other terms when they, when they feel it's effective. 
The monad is the aspect of the whole, the singular, the, the one that is also plural. So when you activate at that level, it's God knowing itself in agreement to itself through all manifestation. And that's that. where they're taking us. So when I said, yeah, you, you, when you said, no, you can't will yourself there because you're willing yourself from the old self. Exactly. That yeah. stuff. So this sentence in the freedom chapter of resurrections, it says to begin to move towards union requires an acclamation to a higher level of intonation than you've held thus far. Intonation, mm -hmm. higher level of, what is intonation? I think it means tone and your expression. That's my assumption of what it means. They, you know, they, a few books ago, and this began in workshops and it's in the books too, they begin toning through me and they use the tone to claim a field. Um, and it's a, it's a field that you can be worked with within. So in some ways, what they're doing is they're laying, they're creating a level of vibration where certain things can occur that cannot occur in the lower field. And they're supporting us in that. But I think the whole thing is that we can do this because we are this. So the monad or the God within, whatever you want to call it, is already in the upper room. We're not inventing the upper room. There's an aspect of Alan that knows who he is, what he is, and how he serves and isn't frightened and has never been frightened because he doesn't experience fear. And that's the true self. And what you're doing in with these teachings, I think, is you're aligning to what already is at the cost of the old. And it's not that there's anything wrong with the old, we just stop investing in it. You know, when I was maybe 33, I heard them say, and I always say, but I'm 99% sure I heard it in channel because I wrote it down because I didn't understand it. And I was when I was first opening up and I was having a lot of trouble. And I heard freedom will come when the throne relinquishes its king or freedom comes when the throne. And I thought, what the hell does that mean? That's the entire teaching. Who's in the throne? Who's running it? Well, I think the resurrection, it sounds like from the books, this book and the ones that is the resurrection of the Christ energy. And, and yeah. it says the the body itself, you, you say on page 131, is also undergoing a change in preparation to hold the level of tone that is required for this transition. It's, so it's not just a spiritual or mental thing, it's a physical thing. And yeah, it's not an intellectual teaching. Mm -hmm. It never has been. It's an experiential teaching. And from the very, very beginning, the body's been part of the equation. They say if you deny the, the divine in your form, um, you've denied it in everything else in form automatically. And that's why we have some God up in a cloud that's unreachable. So can I ask the guys if you choose, uh, is the whole earth plane dimension, physical reality, actually shifting to a new frequency of being? I get yes, absolutely. It's undergoing and it's undergoing it now. This is in process now. And much of the discomfort I hear that you experience is part of this. It's, it's displacement. It's, it's, it's reconceiving, you know. I mean, it's kind of, you know, if you've ever, you know, moved out of a house or out of an apartment, I know you've been in the same place, but I've moved a lot. And, you know, when you leave the old house, it's sort of sad looking, you know, there's places on the walls where the pictures used to hang and the paint is dusty and, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I mean, it's, but I think we're in this period now of, of kind of moving to something higher. And I think like every move, you don't get to bring their garbage with you. You don't have to. So we're sort of having to look at the garbage so we don't continue to drag it around. But the physicality of, well, the body's changing and moving to yeah. a quicker, but the actual world itself, the tables, chairs. Yes, everything is what they say. But you see, everything that we're seeing, they say, is in vibrational accord to who we are. So when you lift in tone or vibration, you're actually moving into vibrational accord with all things that exist at like vibration. So you know, everything they say can be renowned in the higher. 
So I don't know how this happens, but it's, I think it's what they talked about in the book that they just finished more and more and more is how matter is altered through consciousness. There's a claim they've been working with in the last few books, which is behold, I make all things new. And that's the divine self in witness. They, you know, simply put, God sees God in all of its creations. So when you witness or claim the divine where it has been denied, you're transforming what you see. I mean, I don't know who's the you who would know this. The scientist who did those experiments with water and you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's probably a comparable idea, but the guides have said simply. What you damn damns you back and what you bless blesses you in return. And this isn't sanctimonious blessing, you know, blessings and prayers to the victim. It's not like that. They say when you damn something, you put it outside of God, you put it outside of the light, you put it in darkness. What you put in darkness, who you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. It's vibrational accord. It's not punishment. It's just what happens. When you bless something, they say you're claiming the presence of the divine upon the thing seen. And they've been saying for a while that the only real problem humanity has is what they call the denial of the divine. That's it. In ourselves and our brothers and everything we see in the planet. That's it. And um, I think when you move to the higher and you're beginning to witness through that level, you they say you begin to alter the whole world through presence and being it's pre it's not trying to fix it it's knowing what is true and letting that vibration lift what you encounter we are working with i mean people in this community people coming to this ascension retreat this is sort of what ascension is paul is going to be uh -huh. speaking, headlining one of the headliners of the ascension sedona ascension retreats march 17th to the 19th i'll show a poster in a second but i wanted to ask you we're aware of this or semi semi but there's a lot of people who are just sitting home drinking beer and watching the football game mm -hmm. are they also changing are they also shifting i'm gonna say yes and they may not like it <laughs> no <laughs> The guides have said, you know, you can be awakened from your sleep with a kiss on the forehead or you can get knocked out of bed. And we have some choice in that. I've been knocked out of bed plenty of times and flat on my ass to wake up. And it's not quite as hard most of the time now, you know, but I do think that. But you see, the thing is, I don't think you need to know what a chakra is to wake up. I don't think it's about that. I don't think it's about being in with the in crowd or, 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 or anything. I think it's who we are and how we operate in integrity and in worth and in an awareness of the worth of others. It's kind of that simple. That's what changes things. That's simple. But there are these 12 books you might want to ask the guides that are here to assist. Is, is that why they're putting it out there? Um, yes, yes. They're saying yes more than that. More than that, it's a template that can be held. It's a template that can be held as each of you aligns at this level. As each of you aligns at this level, you create a beneficial, you create a beneficial, a beneficial opportunity, opportunity for all that you encounter, for all that you encounter to be lifted as well, to be lifted as well. In other words, the resonance hold. In other words, the resonance that you hold is in some ways, is in some ways claiming all things, claiming all things in like vibrational, in like vibrational accords. So all will be lifted. So all will be lifted. Underline the word will. Underline the word will. It will be so. It will be so. The claim has been made. The claim has been made. It may not be comfortable. It may not be comfortable. It may not be terribly graceful. It may not be terribly graceful, but as it occurs, but as it occurs, humanity begins to sing a higher note. Humanity begins to sing a higher note, a higher intonation, a higher intonation. And this is the broadcast. And this is the broadcast. Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new that reclaims a world, that reclaims a world, period. And they're saying, period. Yeah, no, I feel that. I feel like a kind of chills when we make all things new. We give ourselves new life, new energy, mm -hmm. new new ideas. and. And, you know, I don't want to get too into like, okay, what's the point of it all? Okay, we're at a lower vibration. Now we're at a higher vibration. And it's like, there must be a point to it. I think there's, I mean, 
I know a few things, and I think what's the point here? I think that the species is evolving. They say that this is an, uh, the whole species is doing this. And I also get that we don't have, I mean, they started saying this about a year and a half, two years ago. And I was a little surprised. They said humanity is going to make it. It's we you've yeah. decided collectively, the collective soul of humanity has decided to go higher. And basically, if we didn't, we would reap the rewards of our belief in fear and separation. You know, and that's basically we have the means to destroy ourselves. And the guides have said, they said, like in the first book, you know, you build bombs in the belief that they're going to keep you safe. Bombs do not keep anybody safe. They are meant to go off and eventually will. And it's insanity. But we're in happy denial about this. And I think we're waking up and we'll continue to wake up to that. So we've had we have a choice and we're taking it. That's how I get it. I think the point of it all is to be happier, to be more fulfilled, to be more joyful as incarnational beings and to evolve more towards the source. What, what are you getting there? I don't get that that's it. I think that may be a byproduct of it, truthfully. But to most people and to me as well, that's about comfort. I just want to feel good. I want to be comfortable. I don't want to have to worry that, that the person two houses down has no food in their cupboard. I don't want to have to worry about, I don't want to think about it. And it's one of the, the huge problems with the new age always has been a kind of selfishness. Right. And I hear we are a brother's keeper. And people say, well, they created that poverty. And they said, well, they, I'd say, you know, and they've also given you the opportunity to help you know, to support other people. So we're in it together. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So I think being happier and more fulfilled is absolutely one of the benefits of this, but I don't know why, it's, that it's why this is done. I think this is done, you know, the guides claim, I know who I am in truth. I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. And everybody says, well, I don't know how I serve. Does that mean I have to open a yoga studio? Or does that mean I'm doing something spiritual? And the guides say how any of us serves is how we're most fully realized as the true self in whatever way is, is truthful. It's God expressing itself through, as and through, and then we're operating in a whole other place. And then I do think that there's peace to be had and you know beyond what we might assume it to be. I, I do feel uh, when you say humanity is going to make it, I do feel that and it's a, there's a joyfulness that comes from, you know, lifting out of the depression. Oh, it's awful. And there's war and hunger. And yes, of course, if someone is not happy in our reality, that's part of our reality that we're here to serve. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think I, I wonder if there was like, mm, a manipulation factor. I know they don't get into so much to keep us away from recognizing the divinity in, in all things. I mean, yes, I would say yes, but I think we did it. Yeah. I don't think it's some nefarious thing. I think we did it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's any different than somebody who's underpaying their employees, you know, or they don't want them to know the profits of the business. You know, I mean, it's all all about separation and so much of separation is born in a belief in lack and a belief in lack is basically a denial of the divine as source so i i get that we we're the ones who chose this way to learn you know and that it's been interesting and we can move past it i think we know the lesson better like if you just were born in that place in hawaii you wouldn't have known all the lessons that you needed to go through and change. So it was part of learning that yeah. gets from this. I don't place. regret it. You know, I, I don't regret it. I, I had a rough youth and maybe a lot less rough than others and more than others. It doesn't even matter. But I, I mean, I've never, my process of growth has not been tremendously polite to say the least. And I used to envy people who, you know, would say, oh, isn't this wonderful? The flowers are blooming, the sun is out. And I'm thinking, I didn't even have money for a cup of coffee. 
you know, and all my friends are dying and what the hell is going on here, you know? So I'm happy in a lot of ways that I stayed with it because everybody thought I was nuts when I started to wake up back in 87. I made no sense to anybody. And now, you know, I don't know that I don't know that it matters that I make sense anymore. I don't really care. No, no. Now you're traveling the world. People love you. People are really getting a lot from these books. You are you're serving in the best way, or maybe there's other ways that you're you're doing a service to you. This is your service. You, you you're doing it. And well, thanks. You know, when I was teaching college, I, I, I knew I was doing the service then. It was the same. It's just showing up. You know, it's showing up with the willingness. That's really it. But thank but, you. Yeah, I think, yeah, showing up with the willingness. But I think you could take a little more credit because you, maybe you're even a little more excited about the work than you used to be or happy. I don't know. Something shifted as I see. I, I I'm excited because they're into new stuff. And I'm surprised by it. And it makes me wonder where they're going to go. And um, I don't know how many more books they want to deliver through me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not my business to know yet. Um, but yeah, I find it, I find life kind of exciting right now, truthfully. And this is part of life. Yeah, I say they work in, in sets of threes. You got the first three and then you have that series of, of nine. And then this is another, I mean, I'm just guessing you might have another 20 books in you or something like that. I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm just, know there's, either. A, there's a, there's, it's so detailed and it takes you step by step energetically and um, intellectually through the process of knowing the great self. This is what mm -hmm. I feel like books are doing. And, and it's very exciting. I mean, I want to tell a lot of people, this is the kind of manual for the Aquarian age because the, the concepts you're talking about are ones of the, of the higher mind, of the yeah. upper room. The, the mm -hmm. other thing, I know we're running out of time, but you, you, you used to say, and I love that when I first heard it from you, I know who I am. Yeah. I know what I, I know how I serve. But now they've changed it to, I know who I am in truth. Yeah. What? the in truth what what is different than that well in the book of truth which was when that claim came forth they said in truth a lie will not be held mm -hmm. and i think that we're also at a time where people are saying my truth my truth my truth as if truth is subjective mm -hmm. and i don't get the truth is subjective the guides say what is true is always true my experience is subjective my beliefs my opinions are completely subjective so I think what they're doing is my, not my idea of self. I know who I am at the most fundamental level that cannot be altered. That's mm -hmm. in truth. You know, the guys have said what is true is always true. So right now I'm of a certain age, I'm sitting in a certain place. Um, I'm not always this age and not always sitting in a certain place, but at this moment in our idea of time, it is always true that I'm here, you know? And I think that's where they're taking us. Well, what comes through, and it was in the first book, is somehow the words you speak are a declaration to, yeah. to, to the deeper self somehow, right? They're attunements. They're all attunements. The guides say they work with vibration that's encoding the language. So it's the equivalent, I think, of going to play a jukebox and you plug in, you know, D4 and the Mamas and the Papas comes on every time you play D4 with that album is in there. It's the same with the attunements. They, they're always available. I think how we experience them is altered depending on how much we can hold. Because I think as we progress, we're able to, to hold more of this. I mean, I hear one, some, sometimes I hear about people who read like seven books in six days and they go, you know, what the hell's going on? It's like getting drunk on too much at once. You know, the guides talk about temperance with this. You have to be able to hold the energy that you're working with, which is why each of the books seems to upstep a bit. Yeah. And there's something, though, I think as we resurrect the spirit, more of what we will say needs to be in resonance with truth because the words become all our words become declarations absolutely sense. right i agree a hundred percent 
Well, that's exciting. We're learning a new culture, a new language. We're becoming new people, and it is the resurrection of humanity. And Paul, thank you for your service and 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 just being you. Oh, thank you, Alan. You 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 basically pushed me out on on a stage during this when I was still in my living room, and I'm grateful for that. I didn't know that I could do it, so thank you for that always. But you're welcome. And uh, I don't know, that was just, I just knew people have to hear this, Paul. And and you would say, well, if no one hears it, we're buying everyone pizza and all that. But um, yeah. But I, I just felt you, I felt the words, I felt the language, and I'm really happy for you, your success, and, and that people are listening to this message. This is everybody's message. This is just not your guides. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's a urgence of, of yeah. this upper room. I'm just going to show the poster that shows. Um, do you see that on your screen there? I do. All right. That is the Paul will be at the Sedona Ascension Retreats. He's right there in the center of the screen. There's going to be some great people here. You know Matt Kahn's work? Mm -hmm. I do beautiful guy and William Henry uh, I'm not sure and there I am right below you Paul my new book and of course JJ Hurtock is a great guy and George George Nori you've been on George's show I have actually I'm going to be on George's show talking about my book on Tuesday night uh -huh. yeah he wrote the forward to my book actually oh so. that's great yeah he's he a very very nice. So anyway, yeah, if you want to sign up for this, go to the somewhere on here. I think it's look up Sedona Ascension Retreats and you could use a code for a discount. You could use my name, ALAN10, you get 10% off. And I think it's just going to be a great weekend. And Sedona is a great place if you've never been there. So Sedona Ascension Retreats, be there. And it's a huge auditorium. It's a real performing arts auditorium. It's the, it's the Sedona High School, but it's like a 700 um what a proscenium stage you know you be good to be back on stage there paul but thank you and um are you you just finished a book so they give you some time off now well i mean i'm still channeling and they're always preparing for what's next so i i go back on tour uh next week i go to costa rica to work and then i'm i'm, I'm getting more on the road again than i've been in the last couple of years in the coming months and how, have you met the community in Maui, the Maui family, as they say? I, you know, I've been very fortunate. I, through sheer synchronicity, uh, I ended up connecting with um, the community that was living with Ram Das, and I came here after he passed. But strangely enough, and because yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's one of those weird, weird stories. But you know, they've become my community and my friends, and I'm very grateful for them. They've been lovely to me. Also, who's in Waylo is uh, Wendy Gray's uh, Kutira. Do you know Kutira and Raphael? Mm -hmm. They have a, a Maui eco retreats, beautiful place. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Great people. Maybe you'll connect with them and the music scene and the gathering scene. So enjoy yourself. I, I look forward to seeing you in Sedona. And Thanks. I'll, I'll see you there. Bye, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. See you.